It probably goes back to when we first became friends. I painted a portrait of Garrod, and Garrod took a photograph of me in my studio in, in Kingston. We had this idea to work together as artists, you know, and, and try and fuse the world of photography and, and art mm. and do something with that as an idea. And I just think Garrod's amazing archive uh, really has lent itself to us creating a whole new thing together. I think that the friendship came out of um, a, a mutual respect and a liking for each other's work. And you had a picture of mine on your wall at some point. I can point. make Jagger with the microphone. That, that's become one of the images that we've used in this collection. But what's great about it is having gone down to um, Garrod's place in a studio, we've gone through the archive and there's been some great discoveries of images that haven't been seen before. So some of those have come to light and are, and are featured in the show. I started as a photographer uh, uh, when I was 15. I served an apprenticeship wanted to be in showbiz. I, 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 I assumed that I would be a showbiz photographer. I realised that music was a part of showbiz where I could really blossom. Mm -hmm. It was perfect for me. It was filled with young people. It was exciting. They wanted new images. They wanted to kick out the old and bring in the new. So it was perfect for me. And in that process, I met Marianne socially with Chad and Jeremy and asked her to, if I could photograph her. And then one thing led to another. She was managed by the same man who managed the Rolling Stones, and he asked me to photograph the Rolling Stones. So one door just opened after the other. So when you were lucky. photographing the Stones, how old were you then? I first, I first was 18, I think. 18. Because I was 17 when I met and started working with Marianne, and then I was uh, 17 when I first started working with the Stones, and 18, when I went to America with them in 65, at the end of 65. So that, that's really how I got into it. I always loved um, painting and drawing. and I, I think I started p painting in oils when I was 12 and I set up a little still life. And as soon as I started painting, I thought, this is like amazing. You know, it's like opening a box of tricks for me. And from then I never looked back. I thought I really wanted to carry on and pursue my um, interest in art. I'm very grounded in the figurative tradition and have a knowledge of that, uh, which is what the painting of the portrait of the Queen, you know, when that happened, that was an amazing sort of pinnacle in that, in that field. And now I'm just experimenting in lots of different uh, mediums and techniques and things like that. So working with Garrett in this way has been real exciting. Bailey, David Bailey, was, I think he's... Well, he certainly appears much older than me, but I think he's only about, what is he? He's about, <laughs> I think he's about, I think he's in his late 70s, say. So he was always ahead of me. So when you're 18, it's okay. When you're 18, being 26, that's, the gap is huge, you know. And Bailey had photographed the stones. And, and what, their manager said to me was that what I brought to the table was a, a, a freshness and a naivety and an innocence, um, whereas David by that time was already very professional, uh, extremely polished, and, and, and he was very good. I mean, there's no getting away from it. He was a brilliant photographer and he made beautiful photographs of the Rolling Stones. But they looked, he gave them a sort of glamorous celebrity polish and I didn't do that because I didn't really know how to so in that sense my innocence and my naivety my youth was absolutely right for the time because what they wanted was they wanted to be a complete the the complete opposite of the Beatles who were polished and groomed and sweet and funny they wanted to be harsh and and aggressive and gritty and natural and spontaneous and ununiformed. So, you know, it, my youth definitely worked for me. I mean, I was very lucky to have a break at that time, but I did deliver the goods. I was doing a cover with the band in uh, late 1966 mm -hmm. uh, for an album that was going to be called Between the Buttons. And I, album, um, I I had the idea of taking them, of photographing them very early in the morning after an all-night session. 
because they used to record through the night. That was how they worked. Mm -hmm. And often I used to hang out with them. And one, one early morning, as we tumbled out of the studio, stoned and tired and exhausted, and I looked at them as they gathered on the pavement waiting for the cars or whatever it was, and I thought, my God, they look exactly like the Rolling Stones. I mean, they really look like the Rolling Stones should look. And I said to Andrew, you know, I think we should do a, a photo session early in the morning. So it was put to the guys. Everybody agreed. And a few days later, I whisked them up to Primrose Hill in North London because I thought that we'd get good light up there. Mm. And um, it was very cold. It was November. I'd built a contraption on the front of my camera of sort of filter, homemade filter of glass and black card and smeared Vaseline to try and get a sort of druggy, trippy feel. And um, I knew I'd only have about 20 minutes because everybody was tired, exhausted, stone, cold. But they were great for about 20 minutes, except Brian was turning his back to the camera, burying himself in his collar, and I was really worried that he was screwing up the session. And I turned and I said to Andrew, I'm worried that Brian's fucking the session up and we don't have long, and you know, what am I, what am I gonna do? And he said, don't worry, don't give it a second thought, because it doesn't matter what he does. Whatever he does, it can only contribute to the image of the Rolling Stones. If he has his back to you, it's going to be a fantastic photograph. And Andrew, in his wisdom, reassured me and got me back on track. And we got some really great pictures. And so that's... that's yeah, the great images. What about Jimi Hendrix? The thing about Jimi Hendrix was that... Um, and I was really lucky because... Um, I, I worked with, with Jimmy twice at the beginning of 67. Before he was a hit, before he was a success. And so he was at an extraordinarily positive and optimistic moment in his life. And he was absolutely sweet. He was very charming, very humble, very quietly spoken. He had a wonderful sense of humour and a sense of who he was. Yeah. And he was extraordinarily unique at that moment in time. He was really special and he stood out. And I suppose the most positive thing was that the, the England, Britain and British fans and the British music industry embraced him. They really recognised him. Really recognised him. Yeah. And they embraced him and they loved him. And I think he was at that moment in time incredibly happy and positive and outward looking and yeah, looking forward. Yeah, one of my favourite images of yours is the one where he's having a fag and, and he's smiling. smiling. Yeah. There's just something about it is fantastic. Yeah. It's like joie de vivre. Happy smoke. Maybe talk about that one. Well, that, that's, from that, that's from the same session. I mean, yeah. that's, that's, that's one of the portraits that I took of him at that time and it's one I've always liked. You know, I don't think these pictures have dated particularly. I mean, I, that probably sounds absolutely ridiculous, but I don't think that, that, that you look at that picture and you think, oh, that, yeah, that's a 50-year-old picture. No, and it I don't looks think, modern, I don't think you, you do that. You know, he's still alive for some reason in that picture. I mean, I go into these things very open. I just, you know, I come up with an idea. I try and make it work, and... And then I let something happen in the same way that I think you do. So, so when you're an artist, you're open to all different things around you and any, anything can inspire you in a way. So we were looking at some of the colours earlier on today. It's the first time Gary had seen the, what I'd done with the Bryans. And um, this pink one, we thought, I thought actually it might have been sub subconsciously inspired by uh, Battenberg, you know, the Battenberg cake, because it's got pink and yellow in it. And I think it's... Uh, Maybe you were just having cake for tea. <laughs> Maybe. I mean, you know, the Brian ones, you know, they, they evolved organically into much more vivid psychedelic colours because he was a very druggy person. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that must have been in also my Also a fascinating head. person. Yeah, he you was know, a fascinating You know, when you see footage of the Stones, it's always Brian that I, I'm particularly drawn to because there's something about him that was or something about what he was like, he was something fascinating about him. So these particular, um, this set of um, Brian images is, the colours in a way reflect, I think, uh, um, his what, personality. What was Brian like? Oh, 
the, the thing about Brian is that he wasn't really very nice. Um, one didn't realize that at time because he was capable of tremendous charm. And the first time I met him was in quite late 64 and he was in a social environment and he was very, very sweet and very nice and he was really lovely and I was really struck by how lovely and charming he was. And he was great at the first session and he looked fantastic. But when I went to America with them on their tour at the end of 65, it was quite clear that he had demons that would manifest themselves in very odd and rather frightening ways and that he was always on the on the edge which one didn't realize initially and he was actually a very difficult person to get on with he was capable of great charm and could then turn on a sixpence as they say and become really quite unpleasant could be very vicious um, he did some very strange, irrational things. He got out of a limo in a traffic jam in, I think it was Chicago, and just disappeared for two or three days. Nobody knew where he'd gone. We, were, we had a few days off in Miami, and we were staying in the most luxurious hotel called the Fontainebleau Hotel. Mm -hmm. And in front of the Fontainebleau Hotel on the beach, they had a large area of ocean sort of cordoned off with red boys. And you could rent little boats, motorized boats, like little dodgem cars, but they were boats. And you'd go off and you'd stay in this cordoned area of ocean and you could just race with each other. And it was just crazy fun. And that's what we were doing. And then Brian, who'd been locked up in his room taking acid, but we didn't know that he'd been taking acid, <laughs> uh, with, with um, his girlfriend, Astrid, um, Anita Pallenberg. And um, she'd gone that morning and he turned up ready to go on the boats. And so he got on the boats and we all went into this cordoned off area ready to play and we were having a great time. We turned around, Brian had just pointed out to sea and had head out to sea. And the people, on, the people who ran the boat company went absolutely mad. They were screaming and shouting and, you know, come back, come back. And Brian just headed out. He just went out to sea until he ran out of petrol. And they had to go and rescue and tow him in. And when he towed in, they towed in, he had a smile on his face. That, that biggest grin of, of, of naughty schoolboy grin. And I, I don't know who somebody said, you know, where, what were you doing? You know, like, where were you going? And he said, oh, I just wanted to be with the seagulls. I mean, he was a very strange cat. You know, he was a very strange man. He had a, a water, he had a thing for water whatever oh, did he? definitely so the blue one might be well that the blue one Ocean, it, it, that's what i said yeah blue. Yeah. Mean, yeah his ending is very much down his, his ending he died he drowned in his swimming pool but also in his home he'd painted a mural uh, very crudely but he'd painted a mural i photographed him with it and it's a gravestone r-i-p it doesn't say who it is with an ocean with a rain cloud over it and, and Marianne it, it said, you know, that they all knew that it was his own. I've been showing my work as photographic prints for since 92. That was when I had my first solo show. And, and so, and that, I rediscovered that picture at, at around about that time. It was about the third time I'd photographed Marianne. And I'd sort of was pretty much in awe of her. I mean, she was beautiful and she was l funny and she was sweet. We we're almost exactly the same age. So we were both, I think we were both 17. And um, I knew the pub because the pub called the Salisbury pub in um, St. Martin's Lane is, is known as a theatrical pub. And I'd known it from uh, working in the theater, photographing actors and things like that. And I just thought it would be a, a lovely location for her. And um, I remember the session very well because this particular picture was rejected by the record company because of the people in the mirror. You can't really see them in the new version, but they're there. There's, there are three men in the bar who were sort of um, ogling her and looking rather sort of lasciviously at her. And um, 
and she didn't mind. She was quite happy looking, sort of her beautiful, innocent sexiness. And, um, but the, the record company objected to that. And so, in fact, on the record cover, there's a different one from the session where you can't see the people in, in the reflection. It's yeah. one of my favourites, actually. Yeah. It's just because it's, all the mirrors and everything. It's just because mirrors are a great way of seeing different spaces and realities. It's great. There's something quite ethereal about it. I get sort of 20s Gatsby esque. Yes, oh, yeah. it. but then at the same time, it reminds me of Miss Havisham. I don't know why. It's well, I, that, I, that, oh. I think I, that's great, but that absolutely because there's a sort of cobwebby. Yeah. There's a sort of it's it's got a um, um, a distressed cobwebby, dusty feeling about it, which I think is well, absolutely yeah. spot on. I've never thought that was no, no. Be right. Yeah. That's great. Mm. Good. So you know, we're trying to push. We're trying to push ourselves. We're trying to push the envelope. We're trying to be innovative technically, we're trying to be modern and yet we're using pictures that were taken over 50 years ago as the base. But I think when you look at them, they're very much contemporary images, you know, they're... Um, they're timeless, I hope, yeah, I hope. I hope so, timeless. Yeah. Vibrant, colourful, energetic and hopefully... Um, <laughs> appealing. Appealing. Yeah, because at the end of the day, you know, I mean, I'll always be happy with this, but it would thrill me if other people were.